folks in the back hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, everyone can hear me. All right, great. Uh, so much like um, Jay Gordon Melton, I'm, I'm a part-time uh, vampirologist. This is my first book, Vampires Today. Um, I'll talk about how I ended up writing that in, in a second. Um, but uh, I, I teach religious studies, so I write on a lot of other things uh, as, as well. You kind of have to, especially in an increasingly competitive uh, job market. So I um, uh, was on a job market for three years, and I had one interview where uh, the, the interviewer kind of looked at my publications and kind of scowled and said, uh, so, so if we hire you, are, are there going to be like vampires like all over the campus? And I said, uh, the vampires are already at your campus, whether you want my help or not. I, I didn't actually say that, but I should have, because I did not get a second interview. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but before, before this career, I was, a, I was a high school teacher. I was teaching in uh, Atlanta. And quite by accident, uh, I found out about this group called the Atlanta Vampire Alliance. And these are so-called real vampires. And I'll talk about what that means uh, in a second. But to, uh, cut to the chase, a lot of them drink human blood. Um, <laughs> and, and there was literature about this in religious studies, uh, but most of the literature that existed at the time said, well, this is a religious cult, because it's just obviously a religious cult. Who else would drink human blood, right? Uh, and there were articles being published about what real vampires are like by people who had never met a vampire, right? They had read about this on the internet. And I thought, this is, this is ridiculous. If I wanted to write an article about Methodists, right, and I had never met a Methodist in my whole life, it wouldn't get published. But if you do it about this group, it's, it's OK. Uh, and so I was applying to, uh, to doctoral programs. And I was going to um, uh, the American Academy of Religion conference kind of to, to suck up to people who were you know, admitting students into doctoral programs. And I thought it would look better if I actually have a, have a paper. So I reached out to the vampires and I said, listen, I want to write a paper about you guys. I'm very interested in some of the, the research that you're doing. And I want this to be a win-win. I want to get a paper about this. I want to contribute something to knowledge and religious studies. But I also want this to be a chance for you guys to be better understood by the community at, at large. In anthropology, we call this negotiating entry. Uh, and they were a little bit suspicious of me at first and thought I was going to sort of pull up you know, a Geraldo kind of investigative reporting sort of thing. But I eventually. Um, was able to, to work with them, and I studied, um, studied them closely for about two years before writing the book, and I'm still in touch with them. In fact, I saw some of them uh, yesterday when I was uh, at a zombie conference in Emory. <laughs> you know, party like a rock star, right? <laughs> different state every day. Uh, and so I, I wrote a paper on this, and I presented this at uh, the American Academy of Religion, and I had never presented a paper at a national conference before, and uh, afterwards, uh, Jay Gordon Melton came up and kind of said, you know, good job, kid, right, this sort of thing. And then uh, I was asked if I could adapt the paper into a book. And I was 26, and I had not really no idea about how to, how to pitch a book. And uh, they said, just, just write up a proposal, and we'll send it off to the editors. And I did, and I said, I think this group is really interesting in terms of how we define what religion is, and in terms of how people construct their identity in the 21st century. And they said, this proposal is terrible. You didn't talk about Twilight. <laughs> and, and I said, what, what the hell is Twilight? <laughs> I, I, I didn't know. Um, the, the ABA, if they're reading Twilight, will not admit it. Uh, so, so the book came out in, in 2009, and uh, they did this kind of over-the-top cover. Um, but this is, these are not actors that posed for the cover. This was stock footage that a photographer took in Manhattan in an underground vampire nightclub. Uh, and these people are probably hamming it up a little bit because they're aware that there's a camera, but this is how they dressed when they, when they went out. Uh, so the cover came out, and some colleagues said, you know, why did you choose to have um, uh, lesbian vampires on your, on your cover? And I looked at it, and I said, well, it, I guess I can't tell if that's a man or, or a woman. The one on the bottom is clearly a woman. The top one, I'm, I'm not so uh, sure. Um, but I, I think this is worth mentioning because I do think that uh, Vampires have been used, going back to the 19th century, as part of a dialogue about uh, different kinds of identities relating to sexuality and, and, and gender. Right? Anne Rice certainly said uh, that she wanted her vampires to be androgynous, right? super strength and silky long hair right? at, the, at the same time. So I'll, I'll come circle back around to issues of, of, uh, of sexuality in a, in a second. OK, uh, I'm guessing a lot of people in the room saw the, the South Park episode, uh, The Ungroundable where a hot topic moves into South Park, 
and the sort of the click, the students who are normally honor students become uh, vampires. Uh, and actually, the, the creators of South Park kind of did their research going on uh, websites for the real vampire community. And so some of the terminology that they're using, I'm a sanguinarian vampire, I'm a psychic vampire, um, it was, was, uh, was accurate. Um, so in the age of the internet, really anybody who wants to know about this community or thinks that they might be a real vampire can go online uh, and find this uh, very easily. Uh, earlier, somebody mentioned uh, Michelle uh, Belanger. Oh, let's see, I think I have a pointer here. A laser pointer? Whoops. Yeah, it's at the bottom. I have so many silver buttons. Okay. I kept there we go. So <laughs> this, this is Michelle Belanger, uh, and she uh, is a psychic on the show Paranormal States. Um, she's written several books. Um, she identifies as a psychic vampire. Uh, she writes fiction. She has a band called Urn. Um, over here, you see Don Henry who uh, was on the uh, sci-fi show uh, Mad Mad House, where he was actually drinking uh, blood. And this is actually the set of a music video that they're doing for one of uh, Michelle's uh, uh, videos. So they don't dress like this all the time. Uh, but there is a certain look that is sometimes called vampire drag, right? The corsets, the, the fangs, and, and this sort of thing. Uh, and so what I found during my time with the vampires is that some of them would dress the part, uh, and some of them wouldn't. So there's a distinction between so-called lifestyle vampires and, and real vampires, which I'll get to uh, in, in just a second. Let's see. This is forward, okay. Uh, Patrick Rogers, uh, a lifestyle vampire uh, from Philadelphia, uh, runs an event every year called the, uh, the Dracula Ball uh, and, and is also heavily involved in the, in the music industry. He has uh, porcelain fangs that are permanently installed in his, uh, in his mouth, and you know, he likes to dress kind of like Johnny Cash you know, on, a, on a typical uh, day. But this, this moment was interesting because um, shortly after the, the banking crisis of 2008, he was in a situation where he bought a house, the bank felt it was worth much more um, than, it, than it had been um, valued at by an appraiser, and they forced place this very expensive insurance policy uh, on it, and he uh, took them to court over this, they did not show up in court, and he basically did the paperwork uh, to, to punish the bank, right, for not showing up in, in court, for blowing off uh, a legal summons. And the bank continued to blow him off, and he eventually organized a police auction of the bank's assets, right, for failure to show up. So the police actually arrived in a Wells Fargo's office, and they said, give us all your fax machines, all your computers, and, and so forth. You guys have a fine for being contempt of court. So this was this huge David and Goliath story, especially when it happens. And there was a scramble by the cable news networks to get Patrick Rogers on, uh, on TV, except that none of them knew what Patrick Rogers looked like. <laughs> so, so they bring him to a, uh, to a studio, and almost simultaneously, right, just one after the other, he is on CNN and Fox News uh, and so forth. And what's so funny is that the, the anchors had a, a list of questions to ask him, and then he shows up, and they just ask the questions. And they, they sort of, the, the, the news anchors have got to the point where they just read whatever is on the teleprompter. And so nobody asks questions like, it's not Halloween today, why are there fangs in your mouth? Right, or, or, or things like this. Um, but for the real vampire community, this was, a, this was a great day for them, because they said, finally, we got to put someone on TV who represents our community, and they didn't play any scary music in the background. And people got to see, right, Patrick Rogers is a smart guy, right? He knows, he knows the law very well and outsmarted the, the bank. So they get to see, if you give us a chance to talk for ourselves, you'll see we're not uh, kind of what we have been made out to be. Okay. So in trying to get a handle on this, there are a lot of um, people uh, in, in this kind of subculture who call themselves vampires, and they mean different things. So uh, on one group, you have the so-called lifestyle vampires. So Patrick Rogers... Um, does not drink human blood. He doesn't have any. Uh, he doesn't claim to be anything other than a normal, normal, typical, healthy human. He says, "I have plastic fangs because I'm an artist. This is how I express myself, and I just think vampires uh, are are really neat." Um, and then, what, then you have what are called real vampires. The real vampires would say, "Well, this is not about uh, the way that I the way that I dress, right? This is actually something I was born with. This is sort of a, a health issue." Uh, that I have to feed on other people, and that if I don't feed, my health deteriorates. And as far as what they actually mean by their health deteriorating, this can be different things for different vampires, but some of the types of things that are described, um, migraine headaches, uh, flu-like symptoms, 
uh, nightmares, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, this sort of thing. And then within uh, that, you have these different kind of feeding modalities. So the so-called sanguinarians, these are people who feed on blood, uh, usually human blood occasionally, you know, animal blood or, or, or you know, kind of raw, raw hamburger or something like that, but usually human blood. And then you have the so-called psychic vampires, right? And these are people that would say, I don't need to drink, I don't drink blood, but I sort of pull the subtle energy directly out of, of other people. And this is actually a very old idea in uh, occult lore, going back to uh, the, the 19th century, that um, occult texts talk about there's certain people, and they have this kind of magnetic ability to, to siphon your energy off, and this is how they, they get healthier and, and, and you get uh, sicker. And since this book came out, I've talked to people from India and China, where they believe that the, the human body has a kind of subtle, invisible energy or life force in it. And they said, uh, yeah, of course there's people that, uh, that, that siphon your energy off, right? That siphon off your, your chi or your prana. But we don't call them vampires. That's just silly, right? This is, so, uh, for, so for them, this is just sort of a nuisance, right? And then you have sort of hybrid vampires who would say that they can, they can do either, right? They can, they can get their fix one way or, uh, or the other. So I'll go back for a second. So this uh, purely a lifestyle vampire, and then Michelle and Don Henry would be both. They would be both lifestylers and real vampires. So Don Henry feeds on blood, Michelle Belanger feeds on, on energy. Okay, so feeding modalities, right? Sanguinarian, psychic, and, and, and hybrid. Um, so this is a t-shirt which you can buy from the Atlanta Vampire Alliance website. And the, the line there you can see is pouring blood into a martini glass. And the caption is, how do you take your prana? So prana is a Sanskrit word. Uh, that literally means breath, but it also means this sort of invisible uh, life force that keeps things uh, uh, alive. So when, when the internet uh, emerged and you had sanguinarian and psychic vampires talking to each other for the first time, there was sort of a grudge match of, right, we're, we're real vampires, we actually drink blood, you guys are just kind of, you know, you're, you're drama queens, right? <laughs> you, you, you make people feel lethargic, we drink human blood. And the psychic vampire said, no, 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 because we can sort of feed directly on the raw energy, but you need this, this crass material medium, right, to do what we can do just with our, with our minds. Uh, and so one of the moves to kind of settle this was to say, well, everyone is feeding off of life force, right, but it's this sort of coming in, we're, we're obtaining it in, in different ways, right, because how do you like your, your prana? Uh, from my limited observation, each, uh, each sanguinarian vampire has a different... Uh, a different way of finding a donor, someone who will actually consensually let them uh, drink their blood. Uh, our assumption used to be that this was always uh, a sexual relationship, and that's sometimes the case, uh, but uh, more often it's actually not. It's a, sort of a trusted friend or, or, or something like this. And usually we're talking about very small amounts of blood, right? so maybe only uh, a few drops a, a week or, or something like this. Uh, and there's also been a lot of effort in the community to talk about what is actually the safest most humane, most, most ethical way of getting blood from a donor. So there are documents called things like the Donor's Bill of Rights. Um, there are discussions about um, ways to cut people that are safe and sanitary. So one popular method is to use lancets designed for testing diabetes because these are, you can see them, you can see someone take them out of the wrapper and then they're used once and thrown away and you get a few drops of blood. There is a discussion of a uh, when to use mouthwash, right? So if you need to put your mouth on somebody else's cut, you know, you may use mouthwash uh, before uh, and this sort of thing. I can answer more questions about drinking human blood later. Uh, so, so the reason I got interested in the Atlanta Vampire Alliance, um, the first, the, the cover of the book, right, you see one of these, these vampire clubs that's very sexy and very uh, exclusive and very glamorous. And the Atlanta Vampire Alliance are sort of like the nerds of the vampire world. Um, I saw them yesterday. I said, what are you guys doing for Halloween? They said, well, we're, we're having a wine and cheese party in the house. <laughs> got, got a couple of nice bottles of bread, but I, I just can't take the loud music anymore. You know. Um, so what, what interested me about them was they really felt this is not about the coolest club or who's, you know, who's kind of gothier than somebody else, right? That there's really something very strange about us and we're trying to figure out what that is. Uh, and so they did uh, this, this project um, to, to survey vampires, right? 
Uh, and they surveyed about a thousand uh, vampires. And many people were kind of reluctant to do this. There were rumors in the vampire community that this was actually, you know, the CIA or something <laughs> collecting this data. Uh, but it was just these these folks in uh, in Atlanta. Uh, and they've admitted, right, we are not trained as statisticians or sociologists. So we are sort of getting just a baseline of data. And they hope that eventually more sophisticated, more rigorous studies will come. But one of the questions that was very interesting was they asked them, if, if you're a blood drinker and you can't get your blood, right, what do you, uh, what do you use as a, as a second? And so you see here the most, uh, the most common one is uh, animal blood, followed closely by chocolate. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you, you, you do what you, what you can. Uh, and then you see other things on here, you know, herbal teas, red wine. And, and then down here, there's some really weird ones. Sucking on pennies uh, is, is one of them. Um, cigarettes, <laughs> I see. So, I mean, we can, deer blood capsules, I don't even know what that is. Um, I guess if you're a hunter and you have a pill machine in your garage, you could, you could make something like this. Um, so there's going to be a long time before um, sort of more substantive theories have been drawn out of this data, but the data itself is very interested. I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that they even were collecting this data. Um, this is uh, not what you would expect a religious cult, which is how this group was previously characterized, to, to behave. Let's see. I'm really bad at this clicker. Okay. Um, for, for those who are uh, psychic vampires, who feed uh, psychically, this is the logo for the Atlanta Vampire Alliance. And uh, in, in discussions of psychic vampirism, they would say people who are, have some kind of clairvoyant ability or can see auras or can see energy that is normally uh, in, invisible, and it's invisible to me, um, but, but some people claim they can see it, they will say a psychic vampire, you can actually see these tentacles kind of emerging out of their aura and then latching on to other people. And then you can see their energy getting pulled out and, uh, and going into, into them. So these tentacles here on the, uh, on the logo are sort of meant to, to represent that. And there's actually a book called The Ethical Psychic Vampire, right? Because they've said most people who are psychic vampires don't know it, right? So you have that one friend and they show up and you just feel exhausted right after talking to them for five minutes. And, and people who believe in this would say, well, it's, it's not a metaphor, they really did siphon your energy out, right? This is really how they, they operate. So psychic vampires like Michelle Belanger would say, well, you know, if I, uh, if I get all my energy from just one person and I just sort of take everything they have, you know, that's, that's going to be damaging, that's going to be unethical. But if I go to, say, a Pentecostal church, right, where everyone is speaking in tongues, and I just, you know, I take a little bit of energy from everybody at the congregation, right, then I'm not really doing any harm. And in fact, um, because she is used to kind of what she would call working with energy and manipulating energy, she could even in her own way kind of make it a better service for everybody, like kind of helping to regulate. So rock concerts, uh, church services, these are all areas where they would say, uh, we can feed, there's a lot of energy flying around already, we can feed without making anybody tired or, or doing anything like that. Okay. Um, some other things I discovered once I started looking more into psychic vampires. So there was an interview with Dolly Parton. And I didn't know this about Dolly Parton, but apparently she gets up at 4 a.m. every day and writes you know, two country songs before breakfast. And it's just this dynamo and just goes and goes and goes all day. And in this interview, they asked her, you know, how are you able to do this day after day? And she said, well, because I'm an energy vampire. <laughs> and I don't know if that was her exact voice, but she definitely used the term energy vampire, right? <laughs> And she said, I take energy from people around me, and then I give it back. Right? Now, I don't think that she meant literally, right, in some sort of occult sense, that my aura is siphoning off people's life force and this kind of thing. But there's a kind of gray area. I think this was very much at stake with, with the last uh, presentation that we saw. There's a gray area where it's not easy to tell. Is this a metaphor for something else that's kind of hard to describe, some kind of psychological process? Or is this literally uh, a model where people are consuming on each other's psychic energy? Oprah Magazine also uh, had an article uh, about avoiding psychic vampires. And for the first three quarters of the article, you know, saying things like, don't engage people that just want to complain, you know. And you're reading it, and you're saying, okay, so this is talking about, you know, this, is a, this is a metaphor for, pe for dramatic people, right, people who are emotionally draining. And then the last paragraph says, you know, use your aura to generate a white shield of protection Right, that will bounce on. And so I'm like, okay, well, wait a second. Now we're not talking about a metaphor anymore. We just sh subtly shifted, right, from 
uh, a metaphor for emotions to, to something more, more literal and esoteric. Okay. Um, which of the following conditions have you been diagnosed with? So when I talk about this with, with people, a very common question is, you know, what if all these people just have anemia, right? Or what if there is some kind of simple uh, medical explanation for, for all of this? Uh, and I have to make a caveat, I have zero medical training at all, so I'm not qualified to, to make guesses about that. Uh, but the Atlanta Vampire Alliance and their very kind of preliminary sort of data collection, um, they did find some, some interesting things. So you see here, anemia is actually very, uh, is much higher than normal, at least as it's reported. Uh, migraine and headaches uh, are, are very high. Uh, fibromyalgia, which is not well understood, is much higher uh, than in the average uh, population. Um, there, in the 80s, there was a theory that vampirism had always been porphyria. It had been misdiagnosed porphyria. I don't find this theory very compelling, uh, but you did see there were a few reports uh, of that. There's tuberculosis down there. So we can, of course, these are people who are still alive. We can talk about having tuberculosis, right? So it's a little bit, a little bit different. Um, another question they asked is, where do you, where do you live? So this was somewhat limited by language. The survey was translated from English into, I believe, Spanish, French, German, and Russian. Uh, so it's possible that there are uh, vampires in countries where none of those languages are spoken, that we're not able to participate simply because of the language barrier. Uh, and it's also possible that at least some of these are, are, um, are false reports, or that people do not actually live uh, where, they, where they claim to be. Um, but you see uh, a, a large population in the UK, uh, in Canada, and the United States. Um, not that many in Russia, but there's coming to be suspicion that there may be kind of a, a parallel community uh, in, in, in Russia. This, this data was collected in 2007, so there's a better understanding of that now. Uh, and then places where you wouldn't really think vampire at all, you know, places like uh, Kuwait, right? Um, sort of the Muslim world, Brazil. I've gotten emails from uh, South America from, from vampires. Um, so this is a lot more widely disseminated than people think, right? This is not just something that's uh, isolated to Manhattan. Okay, so making sense of the, of the vampires, this is what's actually interesting to me, and this is uh, why I think this is significant, right? I think the history of this community uh, and its sort of relation to pop culture is, is interesting, but I actually think that there's something much more important uh, going on here. And the first thing I noticed that got me interested about this was the, the, the claims of these vampires are so different from how we normally perceive reality that when we hear this, right, we kind of have two boxes that we can stick it into, right? So one is, it's a religious thing, right? Because we're used to people having odd beliefs if those are religious points of view, right? if they're religious perspectives. Uh, so there were entries in, you know, encyclopedias of religion and American culture on, on vampires. And then the other box is, they're just crazy. Right? This is a delusion, it's a mental illness, and often, you know, if, if people at parties or something, and they say, oh, you wrote a book, that's cool, what's your book about? Oh, it's about vampires. And, oh, so like, like Bram Stoker, like you wrote about Dracula? Said, well, no, I, I write about people who are actually drinking blood, and then the immediate reaction is, oh, so you're writing about freaks. You, <laughs> you, you collect freaks, right? And, and even, um, you know, my current position, someone asked me, so you study mad people, right? Um, and I, I, I don't think that they are mentally ill, right? Now, um, there is psychiatric literature on what's called uh, clinical vampirism, or sometimes uh, the term Rensfield syndrome gets, gets thrown around. Now, these diagnoses are not actually in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, so they're kind of more folk um, diagnoses. But the cases that these are based on are not people that are going to goth clubs or reading Anne Rice. Um, these are people who really, um, have severe schizophrenia and are, are compelled to attack people and, and drink blood. And it's not, uh, it, so the people in these psychiatric cases often are, are so incoherent, they're certainly not using the term vampire or, or able to give an account of why they do the things that they do. It's the psychiatrist who views their behavior and thinks of vampires, right? Um, so, so the people that I talk to basically seem to be fully rational people, except that they were beginning with a different set of premises, right? So they're saying, well, you know, I. Growing up, I was sick a lot, and I felt this craving for, for blood, right? And when I finally drank some blood, my symptoms got better, and I thought about this for a long time, and this sort of thing. And I thought, well, if I had a craving for blood, I would probably come to the exact same conclusions that, that, that you did, right? So I, I think that it is, uh, 
it, it is short-sighted to just immediately put all of this in the mental illness box. But that means we need a different box, right? We're really uncomfortable as a culture with things that we can't stick into uh, a, a box, right? What are they if this is not a, not a religion and, and not a mental illness? Okay. Um, so Don Perlmutter is uh, one of the first people to write about this community uh, and has kind of become a, a little bit of my nemesis over the years because she really feels that, um, that this community is dangerous, right? That maybe not everyone who identifies as a vampire uh, is a potential murderer or is potentially going to attack someone and drink their blood, but that this sort of breeds um, serial killers or breeds what she would call ritualistic uh, murder. And in general, in, in my research, I am very critical uh, of people that claim to be experts in things like occult crime or ritualized murder or things like this because I think that um, crime should be solved based on things like eyewitnesses, motives, physical evidence, right, and not um, very elaborate claims that, for instance, certain symbols or, or things like this can, can be used to figure out who is a, who is a criminal and who isn't. Um, but she noted that there were things about this that seem religious from her research on, on websites. So she says here, vampirism, like other religions, so she's assuming it's a religion, uh, consists of people who have committed themselves to an ideology, maintain ethical tenets within a hierarchical system, and participate in rituals specific to their clans. Okay, so this was kind of the, the extant literature uh, when I began uh, my research. And I was in the, the Bible Belt, and I talked to at least most of the vampires that I spoke with said, well, actually, I... I go to church every Sunday. I've never found out I was drinking blood, right? I would get, I would get kicked out of church, right? So for them, uh, this was not a religious thing uh, at all. I even met, uh, very briefly online, a Jewish vampire. I said, well, actually, blood is not kosher. <laughs> so every year, I atone for all the blood that I drank, and then I, and then I do it again, right? So there, it's clearly not a religious part of his identity. It's, it's, it's something else. Uh, but there are movements within kind of the vampire subculture that are... Uh, definitely religious, right, or have presented themselves as vampire religions. So here is Michelle again, uh, and I said she has lots of hats, right, she's a real Renaissance uh, woman, uh, and one of those is as a, a priestess. So she has a, a community out in Ohio uh, called House Keperu, uh, which is for, uh, for vampires and other people who are kind of uh, energy workers, and she is a licensed minister uh, in the state of Ohio. And there is a set of rituals that her community, House Keperu, uh, uses uh, for things like weddings and funerals. So over here, this is her, this is her doing a, a, a hand fasting ritual. So these are often adapted from Wicca and sort of um, esoteric or pagan uh, uh, religions. Uh, and over here, she's doing a funeral, right? And I don't know uh, exactly what the, the empty chalice is, is for, but this is part of a ritual that they, that they designed when someone in their community died. That they could come in and have a vampire uh, funeral. So it can be, it can serve the role of a religion in the life of an individual <coughs> vampire. And others have said things like, you know, this is no more religious than a diabetic who has to take insulin, right? That, that insulin is a religion. Okay. This was a very interesting question. So if you were given the means to permanently end your vampiric condition and could instead live a normal, non vampiric life, would you eagerly pursue this opportunity? So the majority said no. But a little bit over 8% said yes, right? That actually they don't like being a vampire, right? This was not something that they chose, at least that's their perspective of it, right? They did not choose this, uh, that they were born this way. And that being a vampire is, is a pain in the ass, right? Having to feed. Um, and, and some of the other things that they have described is, you know, that because they are a psychic vampire, they're sort of um, more empathetic. They have a better ability to kind of sense people's emotions and, and things like this. Uh, and that this can sometimes be an asset, it can sometimes be useful to have that information, but it can also sometimes be uh, overwhelming. Um, so some of them have said actually they would, they would rather not be uh, a vampire. There's, so we, we're back to uh, uh, Barnabas Collins from this morning, right? the, the reluctant vampire. Okay, uh, so especially in the 80s, you had some of these uh, religious models of, of vampirism, particularly a group called the Temple of the Vampire, uh, based somewhere out in, I believe, Seattle, uh, and may have just been a guy in a basement, actually. There's, there's lots of books from this organization, but no physical building or anything. Uh, and they would say, you know, if you buy our book and you pay us membership dues, right, we will initiate you as a vampire, right? We will turn you into uh, a vampire. 
Uh, but the more common um, explanation of this now is that no one can turn you into a vampire. You either are one to begin with, you're either born that way, or, or you're not, right? And this is uh, very closely uh, following kind of the discussion around uh, sexual orientation, right? This is not a choice, right? Um, and so you have, a, you have a variety of models out there still. So uh, the idea that this is not something you choose oops, um, is called awakening, right? So these, these vampires will have narratives of, you know, how did you awaken, right? And these are often stories that are like, you know, in high school, I, I didn't fit in, and I would see, you know, these, these frightening clouds coming off of people that I now understand are energy, and I would see the energy coming into me, and I would feel better, I thought I was losing my mind, and then I realized, I'm just a psychic vampire, right? Um, so th they all have stories like this, right? And then there's another model where you know it's sort of undergo this ritual, right? And you will you will uh, change your status from a normal human to to a vampire. And then in the middle, right, you have groups like um, like House Keperu, right, where Michelle Ballinger would say, well, we are a group. We do exercises to kind of uh, hone our understanding, our ability to perceive uh, psychic energy but that this is not for everybody, right? That only certain people um, are, are meant for here. So this is a little bit like, you know, the X-Men right? or something like this, right? It's a, it's a school for, uh, for gifted uh, students. So there's a place where the two uh, models kind of coincide there. Okay, so what interests me about this, again, right, is the sociological significance. And, and I submit that there is, a, there is a, there's a connection between the fact that there are people who, as far as we can tell for the first time in history, are saying, I am a vampire, right? Not vampires exist, or someone in that cemetery is a vampire, but I personally am a vampire. And, and at the same time, the gradual shift from the vampires as being a monster, as being something other, as being something that threatens us, to something that is sympathetic, right? to something that we identify with. I think these are of a piece. Um, and I think that you can see this very clearly in an interview with the vampire, which came out in 1977. And Lestat, the older vampire, uh, says, I must make contact with the age. So this is talking about modernity, right? And I can do this through you. You are the spirit. You are the heart. And Louis, who's the eternal, you know, sort of melancholic, depressed vampire, right? <coughs> Don't you see I'm not the spirit of any age? I am at odds with everything and always have been. I have never belonged anywhere with anyone at any time. And Lestat says, Louis, this is the very spirit of your age. Don't you see? Everyone else feels as you feel. Your fall from grace and faith has been the fall of a century. Right? So um, what Anne Rice is evoking here is this idea that you know, now we are in an age of modernity. We all feel like misfits. Right? We all feel kind of uncertain about how we fit uh, into the world. And so instead of the vampire being a monster that's some, from beyond our world and is threatening it, we, we see it in a much more kind of sympathetic <laughs> Uh, uh, way. Okay. In uh, the 1970s, a sociologist named uh, Peter Berger uh, wrote a book called The Heretical Imperative. And his thesis in that uh, book was that um, uh, modernity has been about a shift between your status, sort of your, who, who you are, uh, in the past was more um, by, by birth that was ascribed to you. And that now, in the state of modernity, everything has to be um, chosen or discovered, right? So ancient people kind of got everything worked out for them uh, from, from birth, and we don't have that. We're, we are burdened with the responsibility of sorting all this stuff out, right? Figuring out who we are. And so Peter Berger would say this is a new problem. This is a problem that comes from modernity where we are given a lot of choices and the ability to perceive a lot of different lifestyles and, and sort of think about where we, where we fit in the world. Um, Sartre said something very similar, right? He said, every man is condemned to freedom, right? So Sartre, the existentialist, um, said that, you know, everything is, uh, we have this incredible freedom as human beings. We can do whatever we want. We can choose uh, what we want to do, and we hate that, right? It is a burden. We don't want the responsibility. And so Sartre said, we are constantly trying to convince ourselves that we don't have this freedom that we actually do, right? So... You know, I'll tell my students, if you would just stop playing Xbox for two hours tonight and write your essay for my class, right? You will do well. You have the power to do this, right? So you're in the, I just can't, you know, I'm just, I'm just so stressed out, right? Uh, and so with, with modernity, it's increasingly we have to work all this stuff out. It's not handed to us anymore. So I think this is a big difference between what a vampire means 
in sort of an ancient Slavic village where you're going to live in this whole village your whole life and you have very limited kind of options to today where now Americans, right, they've got to figure out, you know, they've got to retrain for a new career every six years or something like this. This is about average. Um, there's no certainty where you're going to live, right? We have a free market of, of religions, right? Um, we have this concept of sexual orientation. Um, historians like Foucault have said um, there wasn't really this, this concept that there are people who have different sexual orientations in, in ancient times, right? Certainly the idea that parents are anxious because um, interests their children have could be signed to their future sexual orientation, right? It appears to be, to be new, right? Should you even have children? It was always assumed that that's just part of the human cycle, and now people uh, are thinking about this, or they're putting it off, right? And then we have these more existential questions, so kind of the J.D. Salinger, right? What if everybody is a phony, right? What if nobody understands me? Um, a sociologist like Berger would say, from what we can tell, these are kind of modern questions. These are not things that ancient people had to worry about. Now, I will confess there is a rivalry between historians and sociologists, right? So some historians might say, you know, I can find you, you know, whatever, passages in Augustine or something, where he's, he's worried about these, these kinds of issues. Uh, but generally, sociology would say that as modernity goes on, we are confronted with more and more choices, and the onus is placed on us, right? Look at all this dazzling stuff going on in the world, figure it out for yourself. So what kind of person are you, right? And so are you a vampire is in many ways sort of the next logical choice, right? So what we keep burdening every day with this new level of decision, but now one more is are you even a normal human being like everybody else, or are you actually a, a, a vampire? Okay, um, so I wanna switch gears for a second to, um, uh, this is a paper that I gave uh, yesterday at the Candler School of Theology at, at Emory University. Uh, I'm not going to read the paper. I want to just kind of use it as, as notes because this has been a very um, kind of a, a congenial uh, conference so far. So I don't want to use words like hegemony and so forth to try and... Uh, I, I get in this habit to try and prove people that, that, that what I'm doing is serious. Right? But you guys are I'm preaching to the choir so I can relax a little bit. Um, so this summer, uh, a, a social worker at uh, Idaho State University uh, named DJ Williams published an article in the journal uh, Critical Social Work entitled, Do We Always Practice What We Preach? Real Vampires' Fears of Coming Out of the Coffin to Social Workers and Helping Professionals. And what he said was, you know, as a social worker, if your job is to go out and help people with their problems, right, uh, and you find out that someone is drinking human blood, right, what, what do you do? And his argument was, uh, we need to do more to kind of communicate to these people that, I am not going to try and have you locked up, right? That you can be open to me uh, about your, your lifestyle. And he believes this is important for maintaining what the health professions call the therapeutic alliance, right? If they don't trust you, if they think that you're going to throw them in a padded cell or try to take their children away, right, then you can't help them because you don't have that working level of trust. And he called on social workers to be more reflexive about their own biases, right? So. You may actually at the end of the day come to think, well, you know, maybe some of these things that you're doing involving blood actually are dangerous, right? Uh, but that needs to come at the end of a period of kind of rational investigation of this and not just sort of the shock reaction of your freaks, right? The reaction that I encounter at the, at the parties, right? And by the way, DJ Williams is not the only person doing this. So I think that we have hit uh, a moment where the, the medical industry is trying to make sense of this. So um, Vampirologist is a small, uh, fraternity, so when they sent his article out for peer review, it came to me. Uh, and, and a little bit later, I got a second article uh, from a medical journal in New Zealand, and it was the same sort of thing. It was a doctor saying, you know, I had a patient, and I said, you are not recovering at the rate that you should from this illness. What is going on? Do you have anemia or something? And he says, well, doc, actually, it's because I haven't gotten to drink any human blood because I've been in this hospital. <laughs> and he says, really? Okay, well, tell me more uh, about this. And then last month, an article came out from an emergency room physician, also describing uh, meeting someone who identified as, as a vampire. Um, so as the, the, this has caused a little bit of a media storm, and we get a vampire storm every October um, with people. You know, that's the only time that you know, people call me, basically, right? Um, but DJ Williams' article has been covered in Newsweek, Men's Health, MTV.com, Psychology Today. Uh, and there's been a substantial backlash to this, right? So there have been editorials attacking Williams for saying we should kind of try to uh, uh, you know, reach out to vampires instead of dismissing them. 
And, and in addition to editorials, also uh, hate mail. So uh, he forwarded this one to me, and this is in all caps, right? Um, that he was, quote, just another liberal idiot infesting American universities with junk studies. Right? So um, I think that this reaction, this backlash against this, to me is actually more sociologically interesting than the vampires uh, them, themselves. When my book came out in 2009, I didn't get this backlash, right? And I even went on Fox News, I went on Geraldo, and Fox News loves to bash idiot liberals and their junk studies, right? But I didn't get it. <laughs> so something has changed, and I'm trying to figure out what changed, and I think there's a couple things. One, critical social work is uh, it's online for free, anybody can read it. So I think that has made it more interesting. Two, this article came out um, just a few days after the Supreme Court decision that made gay marriage legal across the country, and in the summer where the news stories were Caitlyn Jenner and uh, Rachel Dolezal, right? this woman who identified as African American, even though um, she, was, she was white. So it was a larger conversation about what are, what are the limits of people to define um, their own uh, identity. And third, right, Williams is a helping professional. Right? And I think that there is an awareness that uh, the helping professionals are kind of the gatekeepers of what kinds of people exist what kinds don't, right? So um, Michel Foucault said that the psychologists of the 19th century basically invented all of these categories of, of people, including, he would claim, the homosexual, right? That there's this, there's a certain, there's straight people and there's people who are homosexuals and that those categories were created by the, by the medical community. Um, so I submit that the implicit in these attacks on Williams is an awareness that all these categories of people uh, are socially constructed, right? Society ultimately creates these ideas of what kind of people you can, you can be. Um, and uh, what the critics are really afraid of is not the vampires, but what Peter Berger called anomie, right? So anomie is the moment where you realize that reality is socially constructed, right? That it's always been uh, a kind of mass delusion, and this is very frightening to people, right? Um, why, why kill another human being for green pieces of paper? Because we all have agreed in society that green pieces of paper are, are very uh, valuable, right? So if you look at a moment like New Orleans after Katrina, right, where you realize, oh wait a second, you know, this is the, the sort of idea that I can walk through my neighborhood and no one will shoot me, and that guy will help me because he's a police officer, right? That's all kind of collapsed. You realize that was all just a sort of agreements that we had. It's, that doesn't come from nature; it comes from society. Peter Berger says this is very frightening to people. Um, so I've noticed that a lot of the critiques of Williams are not really about vampires. They are actually Jeremiads about the state of, uh, of modernity. So a really good one came from uh, The Remnant, which is a traditionalist Catholic uh, magazine. So for those of you who don't know much about uh, the Catholics, these are people who are angry about Vatican II, are very conservative. Uh, and the, the editor of The Remnant wrote, uh, if I decide to start identifying as a werewolf, you'd better be ready to defend my inalienable right to be treated as such. After all, this is America. I can demand my own special werewolf public restroom. Congress will enact new laws forcing barbers to give me the full body werewolf treatment. <laughs> and you will bake me a were cake. And I, I guess a were cake is someone who turns into a cake. <laughs> <when it's full. laughs> and, and, and he goes on, right? But. If we continue down lunacy lane here, and he's talking about this, the social worker, right? I wonder how we will ultimately ascertain who is mentally ill in our society and who is not. Who needs treatment and who does not? Who's dangerous and who isn't? And who is, well, quite frankly, nuts and who's sane? Or will it even matter anymore now that the inmates are clearly running the asylum, right? Uh, and so this begins as kind of a satire on political correctness. But it ends with this fear of and on me, right? What, if, what am I going to do if the categories of who's sane and, and who's crazy fall apart, right? What, you can't take away my ability to sort of medicalize people as, as, as mentally ill. If you take that away, uh, it, creates, it creates chaos, right? Um, the, other, the other critique of Williams that I found really interesting um, was from Matthew Beard, who's an ethicist at uh, UNSW's Canberra School of Humanities and Social Sciences. And he wrote an article in The, the Guardian uh, entitled, okay, so you think you're a vampire. Whose job is it to tell you you're not? <laughs> okay. So Beard um, assumes a priori, right, that, that this is a problem, right, that people should not uh, identify as, as vampires. And he doesn't actually say whether this is a problem for the vampires themselves 
or if it's a problem for their neighbors or for society as a whole or, or for both, right? Uh, and one of the things that Beard talks about is he says it's very hard uh, to support gay rights while dismissing vampires, right? It's okay to be gay, but if you think you're a vampire, you're, you're crazy. So he's framing this as a problem, and he says the reason it is hard is because we lack a coherent, objective framework that builds on an amalgamation of historical, cultural, philosophical, artistic, and scientific accounts of what it means to be a human being and what it is to live in a human community. Instead, society determines legitimate forms of self-determination or identity on the basis of consensus. If sufficient numbers of people demand recognition, they are rewarded for it. But until then, they won't be treated legitimately. So I find this very interesting, right? Because he says um, that we can kind of amalgamate art and history and science, and we can somehow do all of this objectively, right? Um, but from the perspective of sociology, especially the sociology of knowledge, right? Reality is almost always determined by a consensus, right? We all agree green pieces of paper are valuable, right? We didn't vote on it. We didn't have scientists talk about what's the most efficient color of paper, right? This is how we do things, right? So if enough people step up and say, we're vampires, that will eventually be, I mean, for, from a sociologist's perspective, this is just how the world works, right? Um, but what somebody like Berger would say is we are always trying to forget that, right? We're always trying to escape this realization that the world can be organized lots of different ways. Um, so Beard goes on and says that vampires are, um, quote, the unintended and unwitting victims of years of value-neutral education. So I'm not quite sure what he has in mind there, but, but maybe that, um, you know, that schools have emphasized critical thinking too much and not enough of just these are good values, these are values uh, that have worked in the past. And according to him, this has created this situation where it's now possible in human society to identify as a vampire. And, and his conclusion here, the solution isn't, as the authors of the study argue, so D.J. Williams, the, the sociologist, to be careful not to proliferate traditional vampire mythology, garlic, steaks, coffins, and all the rest, which is likely to lead to microaggressions that could traumatize real vampires. Rather, it is to recognize that the quest for self-identity and meaning is one that is best done with some guidance. Okay, so what I'm interested in here is whose guidance is he thinking of, right? Because probably not D.J. Williams, the sociologist, right? And probably not the masses, because he says that that's bad. So I think that what he is imagining here is somebody like a kind of philosopher king, right? Who is sort of this benevolent, wise um, you know, institution that is able to say, okay, you can be this, but not that. You can be this, but, but not that. And these are kind of the identities that we will run um, society for. Uh, and so I think that that's what's motivating us, and this is, again, why I think um, vampires are so interesting when we're thinking about identity and modernity and even things like you know, Rachel, Rachel Dolezal and, and so forth, right, is that I think that this, this backlash against a medical professionals taking vampires seriously is motivated by, by fear, right, this fear of anomie, that the categories that we use um, to, to organize our society could dissolve. That we could, the things that we have taken for granted as just sort of the natural state of the world could come to be seen as actually a socially constructed uh, a framework that we use to, to organize our society. So I think that um, um, for, for these kinds of people, right, the vampires, the real vampires, must be crazy. Because if the vampires are not crazy, then their world will not be sane. Right? Um, thank you. Uh, that's, what I have to say, and I hope there's some time for questions. Mm -hmm. yeah.